place full of secrets and illusions. This is Casino Marino, a kind of forgotten architectural marvel. It means little house by the sea. It was built in the gardens of the Grand Marino House, which was demolished in the 1920s to make way for Dublin's first housing estate. But the casino was spared and is widely regarded as the most important neoclassical building in Ireland. It's one big optical illusion. It may appear to have only one story, but in fact it has three. The window straddles two stories and is cleverly curved so it's not easy to see inside. And behind the frieze at the top hide four bedrooms. Even those urns up on the top there, those are actually chimneys. It's all one big trompe l'oeil, as they say. So now I'm going to go in and find out more. Wow. Here to explain more of the building secrets is supervisor Pauline Kennedy. Pauline, I presume. Hi, Alan. Great to meet you. You too. How are you? I'm mighty. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this is lovely. This house was sort of like a summer house, like a guest house for the Earl of... The Earl of Charlemagne. That's yes. right, Alan, yeah. OK, uh, <laughs> I, I spy a secret door, Pauline. We've lots of secrets in the building. It's all about secret plans and clever tricks. Take me to the secret door. Ooh, wow, look at this room. What's the deal with the window? It's, is it, does it go... Oh, it's much bigger than you think, and it's... Oh, it goes more than one storey. Uh, yeah, that's right, Alan. Outside, it's huge. It actually goes out onto the stairs here. On the first floor are the bedrooms, but I'm heading straight past and up onto the casino's roof. Wow. Whoa, look at this. Charlemont used to sit up here to relax and enjoy the tranquility. Well, he did until his neighbour, John Foliot, stepped in and spoiled it all by building houses to deliberately block Charlemont's view. Why was he so mean? Oh, they fell out over gambling or some sort of a feud. We don't really know what it was. But um, when Foliot started to build, he was bringing bricks out from Dublin City and Charlemont controlled the toll road, so he put a tax on any building materials. Did and he? then do you know what Foliot did? He what? decided he was going to bring all the building materials across Dublin Bay in a boat. Oh, that's fantastic. Casino Marino has had its fair share of drama in more recent times too. Underneath the house, there's a whole network of secret tunnels. So what would these have been used for? Most uh, big houses had tunnels that went underground and they'd be used by the servants to come from Marino House to the casino so that the ster servants wouldn't be traipsing around oh, in the I landscape. I hate seeing my servants on the lawn. I, I know, really, really hate does it. spoil your meal, I wish I had it? tunnels in my house. But the tunnels have also played a part in Ireland's more recent history and were used by the IRA during the early part of last century. In the tunnel around this area, Michael Collins would have practised his Thompson machine gun. Really? Yeah. Fired it and bashed the bullets against the walls? Well, probably in the long length of the tunnel, but you could store ammunition and you could store guns here. So because, hidden, uh, is, this this would be like a, a, an, a, an arms stash? Yeah, you for could the, have had your stash down here, exactly, yeah, during the revolutionary period. Wow! Because this whole area was a hotbed of IRA activity then. Gosh! So there's, it had a whole other life. It had tunnels. a whole other purpose than it did have in the 18th century. Gosh, wow, that's amazing. This is one of these places, one of these historical buildings that really is more interesting because of the people who made it, why it was built, what went on here, and the place it has in history. Michael Collins was downstairs, under the ground right here, with a machine gun. It's amazing, and not very many people come here. It really is a city secret. You know, I think we need to get, like, a gift shop, get a few slot machines, pump up the whole casino angle. It's going to be great. Casino Marino. Remember where you heard it first. But before I leave this area, I'm going to take a walk past the houses that were built to block the view from the casino. Well, this is the actual crescent that was built to stop the Earl of Charlemont having his view of the sea. And the interesting thing about it is that, see that red door over there, number 15? 
Bram Stoker was born there. Yes, the man who wrote Dracula. And look, it's for sale. You could own a piece of literary history, people. Even as a child, Bram Stoker had a fascination with horror stories and was often spotted wandering around local cemeteries. Following in his footsteps, it's a straight run into the city, but along the way, there's a hidden part of Dublin that could easily be missed. Although I'm sure that Bram Stoker would have known of its existence. There's something really amazing behind this garden door. People used to be really bemused about this date. See up there? 5618. That's because it's a Jewish calendar, and in here is a hidden Jewish cemetery. First used in 1718, this is Dublin's oldest Jewish cemetery, completely hidden at street level. Over 200 people are buried here. In the 1800s, bodies were taken from graveyards to be sold for medical experiments, so a wall and house were built around this one to protect the graves from body snatchers, and they certainly disguised the area well. Many locals lived here for years and had no idea this place existed. It was only when double-decker buses were introduced to the area that people saw what was hiding behind the walls. I love that such a tranquil place exists in such a busy, built-up area. My walk continues south. We're far away from the tourist trail, and this is hardly picture postcard Dublin. But even in these unremarkable streets, there are secrets to be found. Another burial plot lies here, which is thought to have had a big impact on the young Bram Stoker. This is Ballybuck, it means poor town in Irish, and this used to be a really scary, no-go area, totally lawless. Still a bit lawless today, judging by the police behind me. And also, if you committed suicide in Dublin, you would be buried here. Behind those billboards are hundreds and hundreds of people who committed suicide, buried. And, um, and what they did was they would drive stakes through their heart to stop their spirits entering the world again. Ring any bells? So, Bram Stoker may have used this cemetery as inspiration for Dracula. And today, this city streets are still a hotbed of creativity. My walk leads me into the centre of Dublin, where I'll be finding out about a secret art project. Some of them are really spontaneous and they're written on bus tickets and whatever they have at hand. And looking at remnants from the city's bloody past. There's actually still loads of bullet holes. City holes. And for a place so steeped in history, Tales of its past are all around. You just need to take a closer look. Check this out. This is the GPO, right? And look here. There's actually still loads of bullet holes from the 1916 uprising. So in the middle of this busy shopping street is a reminder of Ireland's bloody past. On Easter Monday, Irish rebels marched into the city and seized many of Dublin's major buildings. The GPO became their headquarters. A seven-day battle ensued in an attempt to end British rule. The uprising was a precursor to a civil war that would lead to Ireland's independence and change the political landscape of the country forever. The GPO remains one of Dublin's most important buildings and still opens daily as a post office. From the mighty GPO, I turn right into Middle Abbey Street, one of Dublin's main shopping areas. It's a short stroll past shops and restaurants to Jervis Street, home to a museum which celebrates the lighter side of this nation's past, one of folklore, homespun myths and little green men. I really haven't got time, but I'm going to have to go in. Everyone needs to let their hair down once in a while. It's time to enter the magical kingdom of the leprechauns. Mm -hmm. 
I've often thought of myself as a Scottish elf trapped inside a middle-aged man's body, so I'm feeling right at home. Wow. This place claims to be the world's first ever leprechaun museum. And if you were going to find the pot of gold and the lucky little fella, you would expect to find it in Dublin. However, I am here to explore some of Dublin's lesser-known legends. And frankly, I don't want to myth a thing. Whilst I'm here, I can't resist trying out some of this furniture. I actually really like this. I think leprechaun interior design is the way to go. Watch out, Ikea. And just before I go... Right, back to business. Now for something a bit more off the beaten track. From here, I head down Capel Street to my next stop, Great Strand Street. It too was once a bustling hub of Dublin. Sadly, over the years, it fell into disrepair, got a bit dilapidated. But here, this old furniture shop is having a new lease of life. This place is called Superfast, the same name it went by in its previous life, and it really is a hidden gem. Opened six months ago by a collective of musicians and artists, this space is open to all and used for all sorts. Twice a month it's a pop-up restaurant, but it's also used as a music venue and an art gallery. I'm here to meet Sarah Braken, curator of an interactive street art project which asks people to anonymously respond to themes posted on the outside of a letterbox. So you just put the box up on the wall? Yeah, I just put the ladder box up and put the first theme on it. I think the first theme was Letters to God, and that got a crazy response. I've been putting up different themes ever, ever since. And, and did you, like, put the word out that the box was there, or did you just let no, people find it? No, the whole it? idea is that it's found, mm. and then I just kept putting different themes up. People just seem to love to tell me these crazy things. I suppose it's they can do it anonymously, and some people just have a need to tell people things, you and know? People in Dublin are more predisposed to confessing. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's the decline of the church maybe. and people don't talk to priests anymore, so they'll talk to yeah, a letterbox like a in the lane way. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that seems to be a popular rep. Yeah, so answer. one of these is my favourite, the Which secret one? here, and it says, work have been overpaying me a thousand euro every week since I started. The reason I haven't told anyone is because I want to make my new boss insanely angry. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, this has made me laugh. It's not very nice, really, but I suppose, but it's hilarious. I spent the last batch of fundraising money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the letters I've been getting recently are really kind of of this time. You know, at the moment, there's a lot of letters about money and, you know, mm -hmm. not having money, and I haven't paid my rent in months. Of, right. It's one of the confessions, so it's really of its time. This one's sad as well. This is about the boy. He's gay, obviously, and he's about to go to university, and... Will he achieve what he wants? Will he find his love that dare not speak its name, speak for him? Samuel Beckett once wrote, I can't go on, I must go on, I'll go on. He can't go on, but he must, so he does. It's Aww, lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. Some of them are really spontaneous and they're written on bus tickets and whatever they have at hand. And other ones, people actually go home and type them up and they're right. really, thought, lots of thought goes into them. And there's beauty kind of in both of those. Yeah, and how often do you show them here? Um, well, I've kind of exhibited them a few times. The reason I'm showing them in the Superfast building is because this building isn't always open all the time and it's kind of a little secret venue and it kind of keeps the letters sacred in that way and it kind of keeps them a little bit secret. It's lovely. It's such a great idea on so many levels. I brought a little letterbox to the Superfast building and put it up just to kind of get people to give me a bit of feedback and see what they think the next theme should be and give people an, Oh, maybe you know, I can suggest something. Yeah, that'd be great. So what do I think the next letterbox theme should be? Mm. Oh, this is a bit dark. It's dark times. Tell me something you wish you'd told someone who's dead. Oh, well, that's intense. I know. <laughs> I am intense. Right, time for a bite to eat. Superfast funds itself by running a pop-up restaurant twice a month. It relies on word of mouth to get its customers, so the quality of the food is pretty important. Tom Lynn, one of the founders, has invited me to lunch by candlelight. 
Thank you. Yeah, you a few more comments up. on this. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, I'm marveling at all these things that are coming into my face. <laughs> it's all for me. This is all for you, yeah. Wow. All vegan, too. What is this? It's a horned melon. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's with uh, coconut milk and horned melon and uh, a little demerara sugar. Yeah, more. Thank you very much. The way we operate the meals is we do a sort of seven-course tasting menu. Ah. Um, and it just sort of comes out fairly slow, really quite small portions, but it sort of stretches out over the evening. Yeah, people come, people enjoy it. There's always a bit of crack going on, things like the musicians and uh, just anything, anything kind of goes. Anything and then we all stay for the rest of the night, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that right? That was great. That was delicious, fun. No tourist is going to just chance upon that. And um, I have to say, I really love to see things like that. You know, old, sort of dilapidated parts of a city where young people come along and they give it life again. It's really heartening and it really is the spirit of Dublin. From here, my walk takes me to the Grattan Bridge and across the River Liffey. Meaning a life in Irish, the river has been used for trade right from Viking beginnings. Large cargo ships carrying barrels of Guinness used to run down here right up until the 1990s. The Lady Patricia and the Miranda Guinness were a real part of the city. These days, the only traffic is the water tour bus and the odd pleasure craft. The next leg of my journey takes me south of the river and into the cobbled streets of Temple Bar. But I get to share a pint with one of Dublin's finest exports. Are you a stout fan? Well, I used to pour a mean pint of stout, apparently. I visit a library whose books hold some pretty unpleasant secrets. It says, cursed, abominable, hellish, Scottish villains, everlasting traitors, etc., etc., etc. Get him! And I get myself a new stylist. No, I don't expect to see it's too little. Talking about a Lauren Hardy. Which still boasts its original medieval street pattern. It's a vibrant place and home to some of Dublin's best night spots. So it's only fitting that at my next stop, I'm meeting up with one of Ireland's most beautiful daughters. What can I do to Sharon Corr, best known as the violin-playing member of Irish pop band The Corrs, also spent eight years of her life as a barmaid. Sharon Coyle. How are you? Good, good, good. <laughs> I nice got you a pint of stout. Thank you so much. When in Dublin, eh? I, I, 100,000 welcomes. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> are you a stout fan? Well, I used to pour a mean pint of stout, apparently. And I had a little tipple whilst you were oh, yeah. waiting. You're, yeah. I'm Irish. What else would I do? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm Scottish. We could be here all night. And what is it about Dublin that you like? Um, it's a very sort of eclectic city. Um, it's, it's great fun. Um, there's a lot of great theatre, a lot of great art an immense amount of music. I find that the people, I mean, always make a city or break it, but here there are such a lot of eccentric people. Yeah, I think the, you know, the Irish are very irreverent. Do you know what I mean? They say what they feel and they say what they want to say and there's always a laugh at the end of it. So yeah. we have a lot of fun and we kind of know how to enjoy ourselves. Yeah. Um, and so welcoming for people who are different, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's somewhere where you can really sort of let go and loosen up and have a good time. What is the thing you miss most about Dublin when you're not here? Dubliners. I mean, yeah. they're really quirky. I was in a taxi the other day and I sat in the cab with this guy and we just got talking and I've had so many amazing conversations with taxi drivers and this guy started telling me that he was a writer and then he told me the story that he'd written and then I was in tears oh, in the back okay. of the taxi. Yeah. So it's kind of, it, that's the type of thing that can happen in Dublin because people yeah. are 
they're really um, optimistic and good-natured, but there's a great sort of depth of feeling behind that, and I think that's why we have such great music and such great art. Yeah, and so many uh, uh, writers, too. I mean, the great thing about, you know, you, the, the crack, which is all about having a good time talking, over yeah. the drinks, telling stories. Yeah. Is that why there's so many great writers come from Ireland? Yeah, I think so. I think, I suppose, we took a little longer to develop than other countries. I mean, we were sort of like the outpost of Europe for a long time, you know. Um, and that's been really good for us because what we developed around the campfire is actually what we've now exported all over the world. Um, do you um, miss your days as a barmaid? You know, I actually learned some great social skills from being a barmaid because you got so much abuse all day long that I learned how to handle people. Right. So, I, I, you know, I'm really indebted to my eight years as a barmaid. Media, eight years. Would you like to have another little sojourn behind the bar right now and learn, yes. learn with me how to pour the perfect pint of stout? I'd love it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> this pub, the Porterhouse, is one of only a handful in Ireland that actually brew their own beer. But can I do it justice and pour a decent pint? Surely it can't be too tricky. All right. Okay, don't, don't, don't look up and get really self-conscious. <laughs> Even though we're not... a little bit further. OK. Like, over all the way. All right. So now we just leave it to rest. Ah, ah, you leave it for a while. Well, I think that looks pretty good. Let's see what Sharon can do. God, it's been years since I did this. OK. A bold start. Yeah, Takes his hand away from the handle stop, completely. Stop. No nerves. Mm -hmm. No nerves. Oh, yeah. okay, no. stop now. Close it now, yep. Okay. So, just in time for yours, so you can top this one up now. Okay. Top it. I can see why they say this takes patience and time. A bit more in. There you go, that's it. That's Can't nice. that. Well, that was fun. Shame I can't stay and drink it, but I need to get on. As I leave the Temple Bar area behind, I pass by Dublin's oldest entertainment venue. That building over there with the stained glass awning used to be called the Empire Palace Theatre of Varieties. Now it's called the Olympia, and everybody has played there, from Charlie Chaplin, Laurel and Hardy, right up to Adele and Florence and the Machine. From here, my walk takes me past Dublin Castle and south, deep into the historic heart of the city. I head down St Nicholas Street, past St Patrick's Park, and turn left into St Patrick's Close. My walk is about to take a literary turn. I am heading to an 18th century building one of only a handful left in Dublin that is still being used for its original purpose. It's amazing to think that right here in the very centre of Dublin, tour buses pass by here every day without knowing what lies inside. Founded by Archbishop Narcissus Marsh, this is the oldest library in Ireland. It houses over 25,000 rare books and has remained virtually unchanged for three centuries. So this library opened in 1701, and even then the books are really, really old because they have books dating back to the 12th century. So what they would do is, if you wanted to borrow one of the valuable books, they would put you into this cage and lock it, and you'd have to stay here and read your book until it was finished. You know, that could be a long time. What if you needed a pee? I couldn't stay in there too long. Time to explore. Wow, it really smells amazing, kind of... I guess this is what history smells of. We know that Swift came here, Jonathan Swift, uh, James Joyce came here, Bram Stoker came here. <laughs> A proposal for giving badges to the beggars. Let them wear badges. I'm here to meet keeper Dr Jason McElligot. Hello, Jason. Hi, Alan. You're yeah. very welcome. Nice to meet you. This is an amazing place. Marsh wanted to create a library that would welcome one and all, not just the mighty scholars of the city. 
he stipulated that it should be a public library uh, in perpetuity. Uh, so we're quite unusual in having a, an act of parliament which says that we have to stay open as a public library uh, forever. Wow, and what are these ones you've got here? You've brought a few uh, selections of here. A, a, a selection. This is uh, one of the volumes of the Blau Atlas produced by the Dutch government in the uh, 1660s. And this was pretty much the Google Maps of the day. Look at these. They've not been um, no, retouched or anything? No, right? no, absolutely not. Haven't been retouched at all. Wow, so detailed. We've taken out a, a volume which, which I think you may be familiar with. Oh, yeah, this is where I'm from. OK, so Glen Esk went... Scope yeah. Dunkeld! Dunkeld is where we lived when I was born. Wow, this is stunning. That's where I learned to ski. Glen I guess it wasn't a ski resort in 1662, but you never know. <laughs> Scots did invent the world. I'm not boasting or anything, no, it's no, just no, a fact. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what's this, what's this next? Well, this next might one? take you down a notch or two as, oh. you, as you were boasting so much there. <laughs> no. It's a history of the English Civil Wars uh, in the 1640s, which led to the execution of Charles I. This is a particularly interesting uh, copy of this book because it was owned by Jonathan Swift uh, oh. himself, and he's annotated it quite closely. Uh, and essentially, as he goes through the book, every time he comes across a mention of the Scots, he Can annotates what does that say? It says... Cursed. Cursed, abominable, hellish, Scottish villains, everlasting traitors, etc., etc., etc. Get him! Uh, and then when he goes on to the next page, he continues on, and he's done it at various different times. But Most here he has damnable Scots. Uh, cursed Scot sold his king for a groat. And, uh, what does he mean? Scots inspired by Beelzebub. Uh, and essentially, as, uh, as it an, seems a little much. Yeah, he, he, what, was he, what was he talking about? During the civil wars, uh, the Scots army. Uh, took Charles I prisoner to bargain with him, basically, and to get him to agree right. to what the Scots wanted. Uh, and, and like they wouldn't have done the same thing. Well, exactly. I'll just say two words. William Wallace. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Screw you, Jonathan Swift. That's what I say. <laughs> That's fascinating, though. Like, it's, it's like some... It's like, um... Furious of Turnbridge Wells, isn't it? It, it is, and, <laughs> and it's funny because we think of him as just, you know, as, as the writer of Gulliver's Travels, yeah. and as a great uh, thinker and, and author, and so on. And you can just see he's a grumpy old man. Oh, Jason, thank you so much. No, he's anything. Welcome. And I'm, I'm, uh, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to tell loads of people to come. Great, sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. See you. See you now. You know, I've never been so excited to be in a library in my life. I think you normally expect things that old to be in glass boxes hidden away from you, but the very fact that you can actually go in there and touch these things that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, it's actually amazing. It really does bring history to life. I'm now winding my way south, away from the bustling city centre and through residential streets. As my walk nears its end, I get to enter a bit of a time warp. This is totally 1970s in here. I experience some of the famous Dublin hospitality. Tequila. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. And I get to meet one of Dublin's more eccentric characters. And you always dress in, in, in clothes like this. Since I was 13. Are the Dubliners themselves. They really do give this city personality. One of the things I like best about doing these walks is meeting such amazing people with their great stories. And at my next port of call, not only am I going to meet an amazing character, I'm also going to enter the magical kingdom he has created. Vinny. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, good, good. Yeah, pleased to meet you. Nice to Six meet months you. ago, this workman's lockup was transformed into a vintage lover's paradise by retro enthusiast Vincent Smith, better known as Vintage Vinny. This is well, an amazing place. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. This is more than just a collection. It's Vinny's home, his business, and his life's work. For the past 30 years, he's been gathering pieces from the 1960s and 70s, and this place is crammed full of authentic vintage gems. Do you live here too? Yeah, just my front room, and it's also uh, my showroom at the same time. You're like a living shop. I'm like a curator, yeah, <laughs> or whatever. Curator yeah. Of your own life. yeah. And how did you come to be here? I had an antique shop, and it went into receivership. When the shop went, I decided I'd open the shop online. But you, and you've always had a, 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 a bent for kind of 
70s, retro. 70s, 70s yeah, 70s, I live in the 70s. 70s, yeah. My most memorable, happiest time. <laughs> These are my bowler hats. Nice. I've one for every day of the week. Do you? Yeah, Monday to Friday. Yeah. Oh, you look good, yeah, bowler. Cool. Yeah. You try that one, that one fits you. I've got a big head. That's a small one. No, it looks like see it's too little. I came out of Lauren Hardy. I know, yeah. <laughs> wow, look at that Aer Lingus bag. I used to have that in my shop. I had it in the window. And I got more inquiries about that bag than anything else I've ever had in the shop. It's so nostalgic, isn't it? Yeah, it's very another... iconic. How much does that cost? I wouldn't like to sell it. You with me? I wouldn't, oh. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be in a hurry to sell it. I'm beginning to see why Vinny's last business may not have been that successful. Oh, look, here's Just Joseph and Jesus. The infant, yeah, yeah. That one is in very, very good condition. Jesus. And the fact that it has the infant is an extra bonus, but I had a sort of shop for sale, and a nun came into one day and she says, me, are you selling that statue outside the door? And I said, yeah, yeah. And she told me the history of Joseph, this and that. Carp it was the, the, the paper saying of carpentry, of workers and everything else. And she says to me, well, do me a favour and don't sell it. And so I keep it. Uh -huh. It'll bring me a bit of luck to leave it there. It yeah. looks lovely. I think he'd rather not sell anything at all. And let's see your uh, kitchen. Kitchen wow. straight through here, yeah. It's it totally is. 1970s in here. This is taking me back. Is this yeah, the sure. baby sham? That's the one, yep. The yep, baby yep. sham deer. Yeah, see, there's the glasses there. There's the original baby sham glass oh, in the wow, box there. Oh, wow, look at this. A six pl glass party pack. Check these out. They're beautiful. Baby sham, I remember it was like yeah, really you? glamorous. You wouldn't have got very much in them, would they? No. But then you would have got drunk, maybe I'm one of them. Maybe. <laughs> oh, wow. Green Shield stamps. Yeah, 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 yeah. Remember, you just went to the supermarkets and be in the dispenser. Yeah, the big huge yeah, thing. Them. Yeah, we used to nick them in the dispenser. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah, well, every kid would have thought of it. Yeah, it was popular then. I can't, but I never thought today that I would be talking about Green Shield stamps in Dublin. No, it's amazing, isn't it? Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. Oh, yeah. baby, some glass. Thank you yeah. very kindly. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed your visit. Sick of playing Oh, I love vintage Vinny. Uh, there's nothing I like more than being in a place like Dublin, meeting someone like him, pottering around a vintage store, getting a lovely welcome. 100,000 welcomes, in fact. From Vinnie's lockup, I make my way to Richmond Street, and then east along Harcourt Road. No visit to Dublin would be complete without getting a dose of its literary history. So I'm headed to a part of town that's been home to many great Irish writers. And my guide, David McDermott looks like he's just leapt off the pages of a 19th century novel. David, hello. Well, hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. You look fantastic. Tell I me, did my best. Tell me about your outfit. Well, it's a tailor-made Dublin suit copied from 1895. And you always dress in, in, in clothes like this? Since I was 13. David's a photographer, an artist, and a writer, and has been part of the literary and art scene in Dublin for the past 20 years. He's accompanying me on the next step of my walk through Merrion Square, Dublin's most prestigious of squares. It's had its fair share of famous residents, among them Ireland's most celebrated writer, the great wit, Oscar Wilde. So oh, look, here he is, lounging provocatively. What's he holding? Oh, he's got a flower. Well, that would be probably the green carnation. Faded boys, jaded boys, womankind's gift to the bulldog nation in order to distinguish us from less enlightened minds. We all wear the green carnation. <laughs> oh, thanks for that. So the green carnation is a kind of a, 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 a sign for the, the homosexual. Yeah, or... it was a 19th century sign that you were of the ilk. I love as we were talking, he's looking at you like this, like... Well, that's not really him. That's just a statue. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell it's a statue, David. <laughs> You're real, I'm real, he's not. <laughs> I got it down. What are your favourite things about him? Well, I, I find him overrated. 
But do you not like the play, the, the witty witticisms? No, of course of the... I like it, but you understand Oscar Wilde has been, you know, turned into this icon of everything. Right. I don't find him as great as I would like him to be. I have a theory about Irish writers, about why there's so many, is that I think the actual, uh, and it's a way in Scotland as well, part of our culture is about storytelling, and there's such a lot of kind of, you know, magical tales from this, from this land especially. So I, therefore, maybe that's why it kind of is more likely that there's a storytelling and writing tradition. Well, that is true, I've heard that. Well, you know, David, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you, but I must away. But until uh, till next time, thank you very All much. All right, well, it was a pleasure to talk yeah, to you, yeah, too. Yeah, you take care. See you. Leaving Merrion Square behind, I pass through Nassau Street and back towards Temple Bar as I head for my final destination. It's been quite a day. Well, my walk to Dublin has celebrated its literary heritage, its beautiful architecture, its fascinating characters. I've had a wee drop of the black stuff, and yet... And yet, I feel I just need to put my dancing shoes on and end my walk on the wild side. We've got to check out the beat. This is Dr. Sketches, a place where you can unleash your inner artist. It's a truly unique mishmash of cabaret, life drawing and live performances. A radical approach which encourages people to drink, dance and draw, whatever their ability. A 10-minute pose with Phil T, but not only that, you need to come up with the best disco album name. Held once a month, this is Art Dublin style. It provides the perfect atmosphere to inspire creativity. <laughs> Shake that, baby. Shake that. Okay, now, pop your drawings up in the air. Let's see those drawings. Has anybody got um, an album name? Yeah. yeah, I love it. Oh, so to write it on it? Yeah. Oh. Would you like to tell us? Yeah, well, it would be if Justin, Ble Justin Bieber did a disco album called Saturday Night Bieber. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> gotta love it. You gotta love it. Gotta love it. That, that may deserve tequila. Oh, OK. I think, yeah, tequila. Thank you. Any more? Go over to Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. That's why I like the filthy This is definitely a winner. You've been included in the artwork. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I never mind being sketched in seemingly compromising positions. Hosting today is DJ Scarlet Nymph, better known as Neve. So, Neve, tell me about Dr. Sketches. Its full name is Dr. Sketches Anti Art School. So Anti Art School. Anti Art School. So we're not anti art. No. We're just anti the idea of having it in such a formal environment. Right. So as you've just experienced, it's a little bit more fun than that. Yes. Um, we like people to whoop and holler at the models when they get into provocative poses, which happens quite a lot. Uh -huh. And um, just have make it drink. more fun. Have a drink, yeah. It's about making art and life drawing more accessible to people and making it just, just a bit of crack and a good way to spend a Saturday afternoon. A bit of crack. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's very Irish, isn't it? I love, the, I love, the, I love crack. <laughs> uh, what kind of people come? We have such a mixed vibe. I mean, sometimes we look at the art and we are blown away. Wow, that's great. Yeah. I had such a good time. I'm I also so loved getting my tequila it. shot. That was an unexpected Yay. surprise. All right, well, Neve, um, it was lovely. I I'm going to totally come next time I'm in do, Dublin. Do, Thank yeah. you so much All for right. coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, Dublin has always had a reputation for being a friendly city, and I have to say, it does not disappoint. I've always loved coming here. This time has been my favourite time because, of course, I got to know a few of its secrets. I guess I've been running round town.